I love eating hot potato fries on a cold day. There's something very ceremonial about taking a stone cold bag of fries from the freezer and seeing it sizzle in bubbling oil. But I would have never guessed that the potato waste generated in the process of making those fries could be used to make consumer products. We spoke to Rob Nickel, co-founder of Chipsport, a company previously known for developing a sustainable polymer called Powerplex. Chipsport is now in the process of developing an eco-conscious lactic acid by utilizing waste produced from industrial food manufacturing. Unlike existing offerings, their lactic acid does not rely upon the growth and manufacture of virgin crops as a feedstock. While Chipsport has moved away from their focus on polymers, they believe that their current product will help increase the sustainable credentials of countless items we use in our daily lives. I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not necessarily occupy center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers, and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. Full disclosure, this is actually um, the first time we are recording with the intention of publishing it um, on YouTube with the video. Till now, we've recorded the interviews uh, on Zoom, but we've never really published the videos on YouTube. But this time, everybody in the team was like, well, we've been recording on video, so why do we not just put it on YouTube? So yeah, this is going to be on YouTube and uh, you're the inaugural interviewee with a, with a YouTube uh, video conversation. Fantastic. Well, hope I look pretty enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I haven't even made any effort, so I think we're, we're okay with that. So, so let's kick this off by just clearing out the air about these two words that everybody, they kind of become buzzwords in some sense. Everybody throws them around. So one is um, circular economy and second is cradle to cradle. And I know you don't use it lightly when you mention um, it as a large part of your philosophy working at Chipsport, but enlighten us. Yeah, I think um, sustainable or sustainability phrases at the moment, I think you're absolutely right. They're very confused. I think uh, even go further with terms like biodegradability or compostability. These are all terms which are massively broad terms and a lot of people use them as umbrella terms as well. So circular economy often gets spoken about or often used to mean sustainable. But actually circular economy means that it's fully circular. It means there's not a break in the chain. You can go from a resource to a product back to a resource. So it's an infinite loop. So there are companies that are incredibly sustainable. Um, they're not necessarily doing anything negatively impactful to the environment. However, they're not circular because they, they do have maybe a, a start to an end. Mm. Uh, for example, um, so let me, uh, for example of, um, of plastics, there's some plastics that are designed to be, say, biodegraded, but then they can't be used well, it could be composted and it could be used to you know, plant seeds to grow the crops, um, blah, blah, blah. But they're not always intended to go full circle. Yes, they're intended to be biodegraded and turned back into the earth and absolutely harmless to the environment. However, to go fully full circle, they would have to then be then introduced back into a feedstock and then the loop would continue. So, yeah, I think these are two terms and that's the same with cradle to cradle. These are two terms that are used really these days to mean sustainable, mm-hmm. but actually they have a lot more specific meanings um, to, uh, uh, to to what that what that definition is. You're right; we don't use that massively within our um, within our communications around chips board, um, and that's because we are very wary that we want to make sure that if we're using that term, we are fully cradle to cradle or fully circular. So we like to think that we have the um, ability to our processes can be circular however before that is communicated you need to make sure all of those boxes are ticked and it isn't a a part of the process that is then tangenting off into a waste stream for example mm-hmm. a lot of these people if you mapped a sellable company it wouldn't be a circle it might be 
a circle with smaller circles within it. It might be a circle with offshoots. You, you get these sort of bizarre spaghetti monsters begin to form mm. uh, when you actually really look at what these companies are doing. So I think that the circle is a beautiful shape to think about as a company, but oftentimes it isn't a full reality. So if you're thinking about it as like a Venn diagram, you know, uh, elementary, primary school math, within like the large circle of sustainability, both the concept circular economy and cradle to cradle fit within sustainability, but not everything that's sustainable belongs to the circular economy. Is that? Exactly. Yeah. It's okay. uh, an example that I use is like bourbon is a type of whiskey, but not all whiskeys are bourbon. Right? <laughs> they, 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 fit with, they fit within a bracket. So yes, circular economy and cradle to cradle are sustainable product or business principles, but not everything that's sustainable is circular economy. However, there's lots of events, lots of um, uh, talks I've been to that are advertised as circular economy. And obviously they don't mm. knock any of these events because they're doing wonderful things. But actually, some some of these sort of the the conversations within that aren't necessarily circular economy. They're just extremely sustainable products or businesses. So I think um, circle to circle uh, circular economy or cradle to cradle are very specifics that you need to adhere to to be those things. Um, but again, it's hard to knock because obviously, if anyone's trying to be sustainable, that's a great thing. So we would we don't want to discourage too much. Well, now I feel a little bad of having missed out all this. So there's, um, when I was at grad school, they had the inaugural circular economy conference. I think it was done between a few different schools and they were really, you know, fleshing out the idea of circular economy. You know, what is the supply chain like? What is the waste cycle like? So, okay, maybe, maybe I can go back and watch the videos. But now talking about chip sport, tell us what is chip sport and how did you get to founding or starting chip sport yeah so chip sport is a sustainable plastics company so um, we take industrial food waste so currently working with mccain who are one of the largest potato processors globally i'm sure a lot of the listeners or viewers will know them mm -hmm. as being a, a bag in the bottom of their freezer of chips or waffles or smileys or something that uh, mccain create the, um, so we take all this waste and we can convert it into sustainable plastics. Mm -hmm. um, these plastics, um, are, so the initial flagship plastic is called Parblex, and this is being used, or we're beginning to explore its use within the fashion industry primarily, um, looking at things like eyewear, buttons, but also visual merchandising within fashion. So coat hangers, mannequins, the numbers on change room doors, things like uh, all these um, all of these plastics that are often not really realized so mm -hmm. you don't necessarily consider how many coat hangers are in a in a fashion retail environment but obviously the numbers are huge um so that's the sort of the primary application that we're putting Parblex into currently and that's mainly because that's where the poll has always been so we didn't necessarily create a product thinking let's make a product for the fashion industry but as soon as we made a sustainable plastic the fashion industry sort of were the first and probably the majority to reach out. So the material can be used in lots of different ways. Um, it comes in pellet form. Uh, so it's ideal for injection molding, 3D printing, extrusion. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so, but currently fashion seems to be where uh, a lot of our energy is going in terms of trials and various other projects uh, with brands hoping to use our material. Um, we are still within the development phase with development to scale. So we've um, we've got the product ticked on bench scale. So we've uh, we've made um, uh, varieties of iterations of polymer, uh, but we're now at a point where we're scaling. So we're able to, um, or hopefully very soon, we'll be able to provide material to all of these companies that I've mentioned uh, to start trialing the material, create products with the material, and we're hoping that. Uh, we sort of, we'll begin to see Parblex out there in the mainstream very soon. Tell us, tell us how you get potato waste from McCain and what does it go through to end up as, um, as a board that, you know, you very nicely like cut into um, sunglasses, frames and buttons and even furniture. And that's something that I, 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 I'm going to get to a little bit later when it comes to the construction industry and the architecture industry, but what is that process uh, like? 
Uh, so I would say I'm the best person to say this because I'm not the, I'm not the science in the company, which means I'm very unlikely to give away any intellectual property. Um, but essentially we can, um, when, when, when we uh, take delivery of, of the food waste, there's a huge amount of potential within that. So we, we, we all know that you can turn potatoes into alcohol, for, for example, um, mm -hmm. into, into vodka. Um, through, through various chemistry processes, we're able to take this, this raw ingredient and we can put it through processes which unlock various other ingredients that will transform components into other building blocks that we can construct into a polymer. Mm. Uh, I'm sure there's someone listening that has a little bit of polymer science understanding or biochemistry understanding and they know exactly how, um, or at least the, 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 so maybe the early footwork into how our process works. But unfortunately, I can't go into too much detail. That's what the uh, extremely clever team of uh, scientists we have here at Gipsford are, uh, are there to do. <laughs> and that leads into my next question about science and design and innovation and kind of the uh, amalgamation of all of those things when they come together. Oftentimes, um, it's either a designer that has to have to get into the head of a scientist to come up with some invention that then revolutionized something or a scientist that would probably work with a designer to kind of come across something. And now at least looking at like the construction industry where people are trying even at the very simplest basic scale to figure out what the composition of a brick is and the different materials that can go into making a brick that is more sustainable, uh, trying plastics, trying wastes, uh, trying, as you said, from the fashion industry, even using the fibers from fabric and then figuring out how they can be molded into a brick. But I want to just think through this idea of science and innovation and design and really know from your experience what it is that you see in the current landscape of, uh, for the lack of a better word, the startup industry that is really trying to think in a more sustainable fashion that is really looking at taking the most of even like government policies and benefits for having a company that is more sustainable, that is more green, and that is really pushing people to right from banning the use of single use plastic to innovating different packaging. Uh, the other way, very interestingly, uh, I ordered something and that came in a reusable package. I mean, we could go into the details of what goes into giving that package back and the kind of carbon footprint that would generate when you return that package for the next use. But I mean, it started happening and we we see it around us, this sudden push towards like mass consumption and starting to think at like the very basic scale. What's your experience with uh, running and designing in a company that is pushing towards that ideology? Awesome. So lots of prompts there. So um, I might forget some Anyone. of those, but please, but, but, but please, but please uh, yeah, please jump me if you uh if i if i'm going off track um i'll start with sort of the idea of um collaboration between science and design because this is really the story of chipsboard um so myself and my co-founder rowan we studied design so we don't have any science or we don't have any did sort of school and, and secondary mm. school a level um science but we don't have any degrees or if, um external ed or sort of external education um completely forgot upper education higher education mm. um around, around, around uh, chemistry or science so um but what we did do is we had a, had a problem we we as designers were using a lot of materials we wanted to ensure that the materials we used were as sustainable as they could be so we began to explore materials that we can use in our own practice and through this uh we couldn't find a lot um so we started exploring sort of creating our own. We were lucky that the university we were studying at was very, uh, very encouraging of exploration and, uh, and trial and error. So we were sort of smashing various bits of food waste that Rowan, who was working as a chef at the time, was able to get sort of peelings and scraps from the kitchen. And we were doing a lot of this sort of ad hoc experimentation to try and create a, a, a panel material initially. Initially, we were trying to replicate chipboard or MDF. Um, so that was the sort of uh, that was the, the starting point of of chipsboard. It was just two designers trying to create a more sustainable material. 
obviously it got to a point where we were at sort of almost a, a dead end with our scientific knowledge. So that's mm. the point we 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 brought in um, someone with a chemistry background. So they were able to take to the next level. And uh, really since that point, we've been able to grow the team based on lots of different backgrounds, lots mm. of different knowledge pools to really sort of fortify a, a team that really has a lot of a lot of bases covered. So although it came off the a problem of design, a, a problem of sort of product development, uh, it then became a, a, a scientific solution. And I think this is something that we really encourage as uh, sort of as a founding team, myself and Rowan, we go into universities and we talk about this a lot. We talk about the need to encourage cross um, cross discipline collaboration. Hmm. Um, because what we're noticing is we're noticing designers having a lot more interest in science and actually science having a lot more interest in say um, sort of main, mainstream products so actually that we're seeing that these collaborations happen a lot more already um, and it's 100, it's, it's 100 needed because it's very easy to sit behind your your door in each of the industries so just I, oh I don't need to do anything too technical I'm a designer or oh I don't need to do anything too fancy or stylish because I'm science it's all about yeah. the science all about the numbers but if you bring these two together really that's where innovation happens because each part of that puzzle starts to think slightly differently and that's definitely how we've sort of found Chipsboard over the last few years we've been inspired by other members of staff and also we've been able to have input which has really allowed us to lead innovation and sort of push what we're doing here. Big confession. I actually took design because I did not want to study chemistry anymore. I was like, that's something that, <laughs> that I was so sure I couldn't do because one, it felt um, too abstract to me. I was like, I, I mean, I can see what it's doing, but I don't understand the rationale behind um, mm -hmm. why we're doing what we are doing. So I, I know what you mean when you say, you know, we're designers and this is kind of not in our realm but how has it been like working in such an interdisciplinary team with the uh, focus of developing products and I want to nudge you to go more into uh, the architecture and the interior design industry I know you're prototyping something and uh, you're you're planning to enter into the space so I want to talk about that especially because that's something that I'm really interested in I mean uh, we, we had a debate in the house earlier this day where uh, somebody mentioned something about uh, uh, using bottles and not recycling them, this and that. And I was like, no, we have to be you know sustainable. We need to reuse things. And I was like, well, if you're talking about sustainability, are you going to stop building houses? Because that uses a lot of material, blah, blah, blah. And that's where I always think about this. Like if, if there's one way that we can really get into uh, the nitty gritties of this industry, be it furniture, be it, I don't know, materials. Um, how are you approaching it? Also, because I partly on your website, I couldn't get much more uh, info on the furniture part of it. So I'm really curious about how you're thinking about it. Yeah, so that's a really interesting um, debate that you had, because that obviously is about, do we continue to build and continue to produce products because that's unsustainable well really that we can't well there's certain products we could stop developing but really products need to be created housing needs to be created because obviously there's more people than ever on earth so it becomes sort of a, a fine balancing act making sure mm. that we're able to produce products produce housing accommodation transport but also make sure that we're being as sustainable and responsible as we possibly can be mm. um so yeah that's um uh, that, that that's a really interesting sort of debate to have and obviously it's not one that you really have an answer to because until we have full every industry using fully sustainable materials sustainable practices even then are there going to be some practices that aren't sustainable but need to exist for that industry to exist um in terms of uh product so um in architecture used to be a lot stronger uh, customer focus for us because um, like I said we started creating boards so panel flat boards mm. um, and obviously sort of uh, the conversation led to yeah sheet materials so production of 
furniture, um, sort of cladding, various things like this. Yeah. As the companies progressed, we transitioned from that board to a polymer. Mm. So then the, uh, the it, our polymer coming in pellet form means that really it lends itself to slightly smaller products initially, mm. because obviously the uh, injection molding tire bits of furniture is much harder than yeah. if you're making furniture out of sheet material. Yeah. So then um, the conversation is still being had around architecture, but then it's more around uh, trimmings. Or mm. if you look at extrude, extruding sheets, you could extrude sheets. But for um, if you look at plastic sheeting, for example, above me, it, we have various lighting. So sort of the covers, the, the, mm. the, the opaque covers for lights. Um, and then so it becomes looking at the environment around us in a building, seeing what is made out of plastic and a lot of the time if you spin around once you'll be able to see probably a hundred different things made out of plastic um and then seeing how they're produced and then if there's something that we're able to do um uh, do with our material things like um channeling for wiring or cables um or the uh, or like yeah, any, anything really i think i often uh go off a tangent here because of, yeah anyone listening anyone uh, watching just pause for a second look around the room you're in and you'll see so many components of your environment that are made from plastic that actually yeah. a lot of these could be produced using our material um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's that's still the conversation we're having there isn't yet a real specific product that we're working on within architecture um, a lot the big reason for this is scale so again we're producing we're beginning to scale our material but this is not millions of tons a year we're talking a lot a lot smaller numbers so actually the focus for us right now as a company is how can we create the most amount of products with our material with the material that we have so creating things like buttons in the fashion industry with a kilo of polymer you can make thousands of buttons to go on shirts or dresses or, or, or coats but if you were to create a long four meter piece of extrusion for something to go in, in um, within architecture Obviously, that could be multiple kilos per one extrusion. So actually, want, us wanting to get products out there, material out there, for us, we're focusing on smaller components that we can create fully, go from material to end product to really show the potential of what our material can do. Mm. Before, before I ask you uh, the last question, here's a dystopic thought. Have you ever, ever imagined a future where uh, products or projects uh, like yours, which rely heavily on a certain kind of waste being generated in another industry to you know, develop things that you are doing, becoming so popular that maybe the demand for these materials or these products is so much that it doesn't equate to the waste that's already being generated. Like imagine, imagine your buttons or these sheets are so popular that it's, it's, more in demand than the amount of waste that McCain produces? And then is there a flip side to how someday it'll just become another, um, I don't wanna say a tulip mania, but it's so much in demand that you might have to like generate something for the sake of, not like you per se, but the industry would have to generate a waste only so that they can keep this going. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting concept. Um, I, I sort of a, something I like to sort of imagine, and I've often said when I give talks, is um, a big trend right now is ocean plastic. So many, mm -hmm. so many things are made using ocean plastics. Yep. Um, I like to imagine this almost comical, futuristic scenario where we've cleaned up the entire ocean using ocean plastics, and then everyone starts panicking because we don't have ocean plastic anymore, but everyone wants ocean plastic, so we start throwing plastic back in the ocean to farm ocean plastics and they have yeah. this weird sort of dystopian plastic ocean farm but um when it comes to us specifically um the we don't just need to use potato waste so that's a big key um so right now that's what we're using um because we have a great relationship with mccain and that's an access we have although we are exploring and we have explored other feed stocks that all work equally well within our process mm. um uh this is important because if we expand to um, it we expanded internationally to and say went went to countries where potato processing or potato um, based products weren't as sort of as popular as they are in the, in the UK or, or, or Europe. 
uh, we would be able to find other feedstocks that work within our process. Mm. Um, so that's important for us to make sure that we know that we, we won't get sort of, yeah, demanded out of our, our, of our material. Ob obviously as well, um, there is always the option where if, the, if we did get hit a cap, then that just becomes the cap of the material. So, mm. um, well, this is, this is the potential we're able to make in a year. Um, and then it comes down to other people to find other solutions. Yeah. Um, a lot of people say, oh, I've seen other people working on sustainable plastics, so you're not worried about them as competitors. And also, obviously, we want to keep an eye on them and make sure that they're not doing exactly what we're doing. We live in a world where there are, again, look around you, hundreds of different types of plastic being yeah. used. So if there's 10 companies right now in our region working on sustainable plastics, great, because there's so many different solutions that plastics solve so like like the headphones on my head you've got medical plastics you've got biodegradable plastics you've got so many yeah pa food packaging you've got so many different applications for plastics that actually it takes uh, a family of innovations to actually try and solve and spread out and try and re replace uh, the polymers that are currently kind of used in the environment so um yeah demand is a great thing obviously there is the uh, the interesting almost humorous scenario in the future where we're so popular we um potato waste is a is, is, the value of it goes through the waste goes through the roof because people just can't get hold of it but um if that happens then i've done something right <laughs> well there's always room for more innovation so if if not there's something else comes along now this is the inaugural episode in our season that is focusing on food production and waste so within that little bubble, um, what is next for you? What is next for Chips Board? And if you want to share anything interesting that you're working on right now. Yeah, so um, as I said, right now we're scaling. We're in a really interesting point in the company where um, we're attempting to get to that, high ne that next level so we can provide a good quantity of material to, um, to clients that we have trials and, and, and collaborations uh, signed up with. So. Everyone's all hands on deck. I don't know if throughout this people might have seen, heard some banging and clanging. That's because everyone's sort of running around, uh, putting yeah, various food waste through various machines to try and uh, see how we can scale. So um, yeah, it's a really busy, exciting time for the company at the moment. Um, it's important. I, I, my uh, co-founder would kill me if I didn't mention that we're currently going through a uh, investment round. So we're opening up an investment round. Um, so if anyone, I'm sure they can contact through the podcast. If anyone would like to. Um, explore that as an opportunity please get in contact with, um, uh, with the podcast and I'm sure that can be filtered back to me um, the uh, yeah I think there's there's lots coming out that I can't talk too much about because that's sort of covered in NDAs around who we're working with um, it's very frustrating because I wish I could chat about that um, but we yeah we just um, I, I tell you what I'll also take this opportunity to thank my team as well we've got a team of 10 people working incredibly hard on this um, startups often have ups and downs. You have good days, you have, uh, you have bad days. But the team that we built around us, the Chips Board, are incredible. Um, they just, they're so passionate about what they do. Um, and really, we wouldn't be here without them. So I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll finish by thanking uh, thank my team. I just, yeah, I think it, work, working every day, coming to work every day is an absolute pleasure because it's 10 people just really focused and enthusiastic, excited about making this product work. And um, yeah, we wouldn't be here without them. And I'll end by thanking you. So thank you so much, Rob. Uh, we wish you lots of good luck and investment, of course. So <laughs> uh, I'll make sure that I funnel through any requests that, that come through this platform and have a wonderful second half of your day. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, I look forward to talking. So Maybe if there's any feedback from the show, I'd love to hear it. But, um, yep. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. For guest and topic suggestions, you can get in touch with us through Instagram or our website, arcofcenter.com, both of which are A-R-C-H-O-F-F-C-E-N-T-R-E. And thank you for listening.